Hello there. Cecilia Alemani turned this year's Venice Biennale on its head. Women dominated the show. And while the decision to do that faced criticism, others feel it perfectly fits the show title, The Milk of Dreams. Esra has the story. The 59th Venice Biennale features work dominated by a majority of female and gender non-confirming artists. For the first time in the event's history, women make up 90% of the main exhibition. And speaking of firsts, Cecilia Lamani is the first woman from Italy to be the Biennale's curator. She says she wanted to include more female artists to compensate for the previous editions. But the Financial Times chief art critic Jackie Walschelegger calls Alemani's vision an absurdly gender unbalanced show and says the Biennale's quality suffers because of it. She even includes only one female artist in our list of favorite pavilions. Alemani told The Guardian such reactions are shocking and wondered why those critics hadn't leveled such shade at the event's male-dominated editions. I think that many female artists working today are great representatives of contemporary culture. Critically, I think that in the last 127 years of the history of the Venice Biennale, in the previous editions of the Biennale, except for the last one, there has been a great preponderance of male artists. Yet another first for the event is that black women represented the United States and the UK. Britain's Sonia Boyce and American artist Simone Lee even won Golden Lions, the festival's top prize. Well, I think one of the themes throughout her work is this acknowledgement um, of the women who have come before her, uh, the women who surround her, the women with whom she collaborates over time and are part of this community of creative and caring black women. Um, what I know our curator calls an ethos of citation as well, this acknowledgement of other women and their role and their importance to Simone Lee. And you see this throughout the exhibition and the importance of women's contribution to art at this year's Biennale has been highlighted, in part because of Cecilia Lamani. While she told Freeze that she wanted to create a trans-historical show, in the end, she also made history. Let's bring in art historian and critic Jean Wainwright. Hi there, very good to have you back on our show. Jean, thanks so much. Now, Thank um, you. as we just found out, uh, the main show at this year's Venice Biennale uh, was dominated by women artists. Not everyone thought it, that was a good thing. So um, did the gender focus feel like unnecessary politically correctness to you? Do you know, it really didn't. I think the point about Venice is you do always see a huge variety of artists, of course, in the Biennale. But this time, yes, there was a predominance of women artists, but somehow the wonderful conversations that both The Milk of Dreams, the main presentation and the Giardini had between all the pavilions felt organic. It felt good. It didn't feel it was tokenism. And it was it was great to see new voices, new people, new presentations as well. So, yes, I can see that having over 80 percent women could have been perhaps criticised in some way. But I really believe that overall, as uh, Cecilia um, Almari, Alimari chose artists because of, of their merit and because they were really interesting artists. All right, Jean, why are we seeing this reaction in the art world then, you reckon? I mean, Financial Times, as we just heard, <laughs> said that Alemani, the curator, has paid a severe price in terms of quality. That is a harsh <laughs> statement. Why do you think do you, there, the, this, the, this is running around? Now, I'm really glad we're having this discussion. I think one of the problems of the Biennale that it is huge and you rush round and often the more subtle pavilions, the pavilions that have got perhaps lots of work in them and 
at different agendas, perhaps sometimes the quickness, the absorbing so much in quite a short time, even if you've got days, it's quite hard to concentrate on everything, almost feels like eating a very rich meal and then eating it over and over again. And perhaps you just, it's just difficult to digest all that. I don't quite know why. I thought there were some marvelous presentations. I thought there was light and color. And one of the amazing things was that actually, sadly, because this Biennale was three years in coming, catastrophic, catastrophic events have happened in between. Of course, COVID and the Ukraine war. But somehow, the, many of the artists were able to more develop what they were doing. So I felt there was wonderful conversations going on there. I, I, I really didn't feel that. In fact, I thought it was a really strong Biennale and there are many of the pavilions that certainly will stay in my mind for a long time to come. Mm -hmm. uh, just like you said, this biennial was in many ways a, a response to several crises as we're going through at the moment. There was a lot of hope and humor there. How did you find that curatorial approach? There was a lot of hope and humor. Uh, there were also different ideas going on, the idea of hybridity and kind of future. So you've got quite a lot of morphing of creatures, of strangeness, of mystical landscapes almost. But if we think about some of the uh, major presentations, um, for example, Zineb Zadira um, in the French pavilion, of Sonia Boyce in the British pavilion, of the American pavilion, where the whole roof was changed into a kind of thatched building. There was not only humour, but there was also real debate there. So there were surreal presentations, for example, Austria. Yet sometimes when you saw what could be construed as humour, it was also underpinned by really thoughtful interrogations of our future lives, the lives we're living now. And you know, food chains, all these different things, uh, class, race, gender, colonialism. There was so much there, actually, that really to touch the heart, but also to really make us think about our connected world. This is amazing. And it's really nice to hear all the pavilions uh, from you. But unfortunately, we don't have much time left. And there is one question that I definitely want to ask you. New York Times said that the national presentations are the worst collection in 20 years. And they also put forward that a country by country exposition of new art is decades past its sell by date. In the beginning of the interview, you said that you were absorbing too much and it felt too much. So in that sense, would you agree with this sentiment? I think it's an interesting sentiment. I, I definitely think Giardini, yes, with those pavilions, you know, they are an outmoded world in a sense of the pavilions themselves and the countries they represent. But the thing is that there are so many other pavilions in the Arsenale, outside in Venice, that that kind of gives a flavour. They they stand there as counterpoints to the other pavilions. So I'm not sure I agree with that. I think that it is a huge weight on shoulders for artists to represent their country. But, for example, when I said about Zeneb, she's an Algerian representing France for the first time. Mm -hmm. Sonia Boyce, a black British artist representing Britain for the first time. There is dialogues that can happen and also really good statements that can happen mm -hmm. about cultural interactivity. Mm -hmm. All right, Jean Wainwright, it was very good to have you back on our show. Thanks a lot. It was almost 20 years ago that the US invasion of Iraq led to the looting of entire museums. But as the country rebuilds, some of those stolen works have returned home and with it, there is a new exhibition. Here's Ali Jan. It's estimated that thousands of artworks were stolen during the US-led invasion of Iraq. Organized criminal networks reportedly sold them to people around the world. But now, a hundred of those items are back on display at the National Museum of Modern Art in Baghdad. 
and according to curator Lemia El Javari, it took an international effort to recover them. The works were retrieved through the Swiss Embassy and a number of diplomatic embassies and also by citizens. The last artwork was retrieved through Jordan by the artist Faye Kassan. The return of the collection is important for locals. They belong to what scholars call the Iraqi pioneer generation. They include artists such as Javad Selim and Faik Hassan, who represent the country's realist, surrealist and expressionist schools. And now they can be rediscovered for the first time by a younger generation. Until now, I stressed on the importance of the Iraqi archive. We are without an archive and without a memory. And the artists are the ones who established the Iraqi art. If we lose them, we lose the foundation. But fear not. It seems like Iraq is keen on holding on to both its art and artists. Other returned works are reportedly being restored for public viewing. And with the fledging renaissance of new exhibitions, media outlets say Baghdad is reviving the spirit of a time when it was the culture capital of the world. French actor Vincent Linden will be the president of the jury at this year's Cannes Film Festival. Linden will be joined by eight fellow jurors, including British actor and director Rebecca Hall, Indian actor Deepika Padukone and Iranian director Oscar Farhadi. New York City is preparing to hold its first ever parade to honor Japanese culture. The Grand Marshal of the event will be Star Trek legend George Takei. The march will take place along Central Park and coincide with the annual Japan Day Street Fair. This year, we'll also celebrate the 150th anniversary of Japan's consulate in New York. The National Museum of Korea is showing off another portion of the massive collection of paintings once owned by the Samsung family. The exhibition features about 300 works, with the main attraction being Monet's Water Lily Pond. The Samsung's founder, Lee Kan hee died two years ago, his family donated more than 20,000 artworks to help write off an inheritance tax. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has unveiled the Istanbul Musaf, a handwritten copy of the Quran. Erdogan is the patron of the seven-year project that resulted in the one-of-a-kind compilation. The Istanbul Musaf is comprised of 10 books, each written in different calligraphic styles from different eras of Islamic history. A new immersive exhibition in the UK has a little something for everyone. It's where art, design and technology meet, a formula that might attract many visitors. But for one art critic, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Here's why. It's easy to get carried away at Future Shock. The artists behind the 16 immersive installations on display tried to reimagine our new future by mashing up art, design and technology. Sounds like something one would have to experience in person to comprehend how that works. Or maybe finding meaning is not even necessary. For art critic Tabish Khan, who came in to check out the show, visitors should have an open mind to get the best of it. If you're a hardcore art person like I am, you might think, oh, I'm not getting any meaning from the works all the time, but I don't think that's what they want. They just want you to be immersed and see what technology can do and see what fashion links in with it. So does art. So I wouldn't label it as a pure art exhibition, but obviously if you come here looking for art, you will get a lot out of it as well. For instance, this piece that looks like an abstract painting brought to life is called Mustafa. Ibi Noya made it as a tribute to the art lessons taught to him by his father. And this one by Ben Kelly explores the different forms of columns with rotating mirrors. There are some works which have like a deeper message and they carry through stronger than the others. And there are some that we think visually I'm very impressed 
Do I get something more from this? Maybe not. And Khan also had a lot of fun with this light installation by United Visual Artists. Where you've got little beams of light crisscrossing as you walk through them. It's almost like you're walking through laser grids. It's really, it's kind of meditative, but also it's kind of, oh, there's a bit of fear in you, you know, what's going to happen? You know, you think, you think of lasers from movies, you think they might slice you up or anything, but they don't. Some say immersive exhibitions are the future of the art world, and others hope not. Take Hetty O'Brien from The Guardian. She recently called them overpriced theme parks and added true immersion should mean more than just access to the latest tech. Whether it's for the art, the tech or the gram, there seems to be a demand for these shows, no matter what the reason. Peter Nobel is a Swiss lawyer and former university professor. And although he's collected thousands of artworks, don't call him a collector. For him, it's a hobby. But seriously, whose hobby turns into a whole exhibit that covers Andy Warhol to David Hockney? Here's Esra with this story. Peter Nobel calls these works press art. He says the term isn't official. But he adds that a Swiss newspaper first used it when publishing an artwork in the 1970s. And that was roughly when Peter and his wife Annette became interested in collecting them. Every day we read our newspapers. We say nothing is older than yesterday's newspaper. And uh, on the other side, artists take out pieces, articles, um, photos from magazines and make them, you know, perennial practically and uh, conserve them for a long time as part of their art. Nobel says he started the collection with a single piece to decorate his office. Then he acquired thousands of them over the years. Now a part of that collection can be seen at Istanbul's Para Museum including some of his favorites. Collages and paintings here are made from newspapers. They're all based on images or words in the press. And the name of the show, well, comes from this magazine cover. And now the Good News explores the relationship between media and art with nearly 300 pieces. Organizers say the show highlights social and political milestones in the last 150 years. It focuses on how the invention of photography shaped society and how totalitarian systems affected mass media. The exhibit also tries to depict notions such as consumerism and digitalization. But Nobel insists that newspapers cannot be replaced with screens despite technical advances. I think newspapers and especially magazines with important photos will never die. In addition to its archival aspect, the exhibit brings together works from different genres such as Russian avant-garde and pop art by some famous names like Malevich and Andy Warhol. And Bedru Baikam's pieces are also part of the collection. His work repeatedly comments on historical events, but he says Press art is not getting the recognition it deserves on the international art scene. Well, just like Baikon faced criticism over his style, Peter Nobel also dealt with people who look down on his artistic taste. But for him, press art is technically fascinating and intellectually satisfying. And more importantly, he says just looking at these works gives him great joy. Estradrust. TRT World. It's been 50 years since The Godfather was first unleashed on audiences, and to this day, it's still considered one of the greatest and most influential movies ever made. And a good share of its success lies in the vision of its director. Ali John explains in our movie Almanac. With its artistic film style and high production values, 
The Godfather did something no film before it could. It gave credibility to a gangster flick. Are you driving yourself, boss? Yes. Not only did it become the highest grossing movie of 1972, but it turns its director, Francis Ford Coppola, into an A-list Hollywood player. But Coppola wasn't the studio's first choice for the job. Paramount Pictures had wanted old Hollywood filmmaker Elia Kazan. He directed Marlon Brando to Oscar glory with On the Waterfront. But Kazan declined the offer. But Mama, it's a sin, isn't it? Unless the studio then sought out new Hollywood auteur Peter Bogdanovich. But as a director, famous for making romantic dramas, he wasn't interested either. Just tell me what's wrong, honey. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm your father. Shh, Lou, it is so I know it's, it's all right if I talk in my own house. Lou. The executives finally reigned in Coppola. Although he didn't have any hits to his name, he was of Italian heritage and considered a promising artist. Coppola was so unimpressed by the Godfather novel, written by Mario Puzo, that he also said no to Paramount. But at the time, his production company, Zoetrope, was in financial distress. And it was a need for cash that prompted Coppola to barter a fee to his liking. In addition to that, he also managed to negotiate, making The Godfather on his own terms, including stylistic authorship and tackling the subject. So it was a critique of modern capitalism and not just a mob story. After that was agreed to, the director went to town. Coppola wanted The Godfather to be a unique experience for audiences. So he brought together a wide range of film styles when making it. He borrowed the conflict-ridden relationship dynamics from Federico Fellini for the film's characters. <laughs> And he mimicked Akira Kurosawa's use of symbolism. <laughs> Cinematographer Gordon Willis, who had already explored a similar style with acclaimed thriller Clute, was recruited to realize the film's dark, noirish atmosphere. I can't identify him as anybody. I'm singing in the rain. The director even reached back to old MGM musicals in order to recreate a kind of vintage Hollywood elegance. I'm laughing at clouds so dark up above. The sun's in my heart, and I'm ready for love. Hollywood Big Shot's gonna give you what you want. He says there's no chance. Brando and Al Pacino provided the star power, but Coppola still had doubts whether or not his vision for the film would click with audiences. I never take sides with anyone against the family again, ever. I was so down in the dumps and, and, uh, and uh, unsure of myself, and, 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 and the, they, no one liked the picture originally. You know, who, there was one person who saw it, and it was the first person who gave me uh, encouragement. It was the wonderful writer Bob Town. And he saw it, and he said, you know what, Francis, Marlon is great in the movie, and the movie is great. And, and before he said that, no one had ever told me that. Let's set the meeting. It turns out, Screenwriter Town was right. The film was a hit. And according to Coppola, its success was due to several different factors. Some place where there's people, so I feel safe. I think it's the combination of the audience being ready for that kind of movie, a wonderful cast, great artists like the photographer, the production designer, the music. It's just all the things lined up.
50 years later, the film is still held in the same high regard. And even Coppola, to this day, makes movies his own way ever since. The Godfather stands as his most influential and successful outing. That's it for this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of arts and culture. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.